All right. Well, um, hey everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Petty. I'm president of the Denver Press Club and appreciate you all joining us um, for this Zoom webinar about uh, looking at how open meeting coverage and open meeting um, uh, law and approaches have changed in the time of uh, coronavirus. And we're pleased to have uh, two great panelists right now. We will hopefully be adding a couple more here shortly. There's Steve Zansberg, uh, First Amendment attorney. Uh, we'll just wait for Steve to get uh, in here in a second. But um, I figure we could go around and just introduce um, everybody um, and then we can kind of get started with um, uh, questions. And then uh, for folks who are in attendance, um, if you have uh, questions, um, I think there should be a Q&A feature uh, or you can drop them in the chat and we can take them uh, from the chat. But uh, first I'll introduce um, Aaron. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and maybe why you're so passionate about uh, open meetings. Sure, um, so um, I'm Erin McIntyre. I am the co-owner of the Uray County Plain Dealer. We're a weekly newspaper in rural Western Colorado. Um, circulation about 1500, so I know it's a lot smaller than what some of your members are used to. Um, but my husband and I uh, bought the newspaper in April of 2019. I'm married to Mike Wiggins, who's also a journalist. And we came here from a, a career in journalism. We'd most recently been at the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel before we decided to do this crazy thing and buy our own newspaper. So um, a year in, we were surviving and now we have a pandemic, which has presented a whole new layer of challenges. And it's been very interesting, um, particularly in covering public meetings where we're not allowed to be there in person. So um, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting. And I think um, reporting in a small town, uh, I've been always passionate about public meetings and public records, but I think in a small town, I've learned that um, it's even more challenging the smaller places. So that's, that's all about me. Great, thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, Jeff Roberts, go ahead. Sure, um, I'm Jeff Roberts. I'm the executive director of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, um, which I hopefully you've heard about and maybe have have used our resources. We're a nonprofit that educates journalists and the general public in Colorado about their rights under the open records and open meetings laws and co court access. And we advocate for government transparency and um, check out our website at coloradofoic.org. Um, I'm a former longtime Denver Post reporter and editor, but have now been gone from there for a while and have been doing this job for about seven years. Um, I is also, Dan, I'd also suggested to, to Doug that we talk about open records in this time too, because that that is uh, also has been different um, and in some places and um, harder to get. So maybe we can expand the conversation a little bit. Absolutely. Um, I think we've got a couple other people who have joined us um, on the panelist side. Steve Zansberg, are you there? I am. Uh, Dan, I'm apologizing for the uh, problems here. I am. Uh, I can see you on my phone through my Gmail account, but it says I can't turn on my camera because the host is not allowing me to do that. And I can't hear you on my phone, so I'm talking to you on my okay. cell phone, so I'm talking to you from my house phone. Anyway, you can hear me, I hope. We, we can, and, and I apologize. I had, uh, you know, you, you read those horror stories about uh, Zoom bombing and everything, so you just like ratchet down all the settings, and then I tried to undo it, and so anyway, we're glad you're here. Um, we can hear you great. Um, so we're just going around and just making some uh, introductions. Uh, well, I'm a, 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 an attorney who practices media First Amendment law, I have a lot of experience with open meetings and open records and access to courts and government institutions more generally. And I'm the president of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, of which Jeff is the executive director. Great. Um, okay, well, I, I know we're still waiting for Doug, but like I said, we'll, we'll just go ahead and, and proceed. Um, maybe uh, Jeff, uh, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, what are some of the biggest um, concerns you have based on what you've seen? Uh, I'll ask this to all three of you, but Jeff, I'll start with you. 
-hmm. biggest concerns you've seen with just uh, meetings in this time, how uh, governments are approaching this, boards, whatever they may be. Yeah. Um, what concerns have you seen, uh, issues that, that, again, particularly are problematic? Yeah. So when all this was breaking back in March um, and, and they, you know, all sorts of things got canceled or were starting to get canceled, um, it was getting pretty obvious that government boards weren't going to be able to meet in person either or, or they um, were going to have a hard time doing so. Um, or there would be reluctance to do that. And so I started asking questions about that, talked to the municipal league, talked to uh, some other, other people, and, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of preparation for that. Um, it was, it's not something that anybody's encountered before. The open meetings law uh, covers electronic meetings, but that's all it says. So what that means is that if, um, if, if three or more members of a local public body have a conversation, you know, electronically, which could mean a whole lot of different things, right? That's an open meeting. But, uh, you know, historically, traditionally, it's been difficult to get the public uh, involved in that, because if it's an open meeting, the public has to be involved. In a lot of cases, it has to be noticed. But um, they started, you know, getting on, on Zoom as the Zoom or something like it as the is the, uh, the means to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of places, at least initially, were pretty technologically challenged. I, I tried to monitor um, several uh, governments that first week or so, what they were doing. I, I watched Lakewood and Aurora and, uh, you know, some small towns and all that. And some of them were doing it better than others. Um, some technical difficulties. I was on one uh, actually, it was a training for local government people that was Zoom bombed, um, and that was kind of embarrassing for the people doing a train doing the training. Uh, but I saw like, and I don't know if Aurora has changed this, but they had sort of a hybrid where some people were in a physical location, other people were online, and um, they seem to be having um, some technical difficulties that I think have been ironed out since then. Um, Aurora or Lakewood uh, did it solely online to begin with. But what was interesting about Lakewood is that um, they, they didn't have in their, in their um, um, charter or their ordinances, whatever, they didn't have the ability, the legal ability to meet online, even though the state uh, law allows it, their local laws said they couldn't do it. In fact, Several of them have had that. So in order for them to continue meeting online, they had to pass a resolution or an ordinance allowing them to do that. It was kind of a chicken and the egg kind of thing. But they did that and um, that's the way that they've been doing it since then. Um, I spoke to one of the Lakewood City Council members afterwards. He's actually a former Rocky Mountain News reporter and he was pretty concerned and I think maybe state might still be concerned about um, the public comment piece of it. So there's nothing in the open meetings law that requires public comment, but, but they all do it because citizens demand it. They want to be able to, to tell their local elected officials what they're thinking. And, and uh, um, some places were just accepting written comments. Lakewood was doing that. Aurora was doing that. And uh, it was frustrating that, um, you know, it's not the same type of thing where as somebody getting up to, in front of a microphone and saying passionately, you know, how they feel about some local issue, submitting written comments and, you know, which may or may not get seen or read, I don't think has the same effect. Um, that's happening in the state legislature right now. Um, the legislature, as you know, is back. Um, they're now taking up some hugely important bills today, police accountability. Um, I just heard that a, a vaccine bill is coming up Sunday. And a lot of people are <clears throat> reluctant to go to the Capitol. And, and the only way, you know, they're, they're, you could still testify in person, or you could submit written testimony, but you do wonder if that written testimony has the same impact, if it even gets seen. So that's, that's an issue. Um, one other thing, and, and Aaron's got some good stories about about Ure, but another another one that happened uh, just a few days ago, you know, also in a, a smaller community in Glenwood, 
um, earlier this month <clears throat> or in May. Uh, they are meeting by Zoom and uh, they uh, wanted to go into executive session. So that's the part of the meeting where they can close the door. And uh, the open meetings law is very specific about, about uh, certain topics that are authorized uh, for discussion in executive session. And it's also very specific about the process that they have to, you know, the things they have to do to, to go into a legal executive session, announce the topic, announce it with some specificity, uh, announce the, the, the statute that gives them, authorizes it, and then take a vote. Uh, and in Glenwood, um, and I, you can go back and watch this, um, they uh, went into an executive session spent practically the whole time talking about a COVID update, never announced to the public in the public portion of the meeting that that's what they were gonna talk about. And a COVID update, you know, is not really an authorized topic. Uh, they later said they meant to say that they were gonna get legal advice on that, but there was no specific legal question that they were even asking. Uh, and they put that executive session recording online because so many people, uh, uh, there was pressure. The former DA of the area made a records request for it, and other people made a records request for it, and they ended up put, posting it online. So you can go listen to it, and there's this wide-ranging discussion where they're accusing each other of things, and um, it's not authorized, and it wasn't properly called either. I, I guess, uh, you know, the upside is they actually recorded it. They didn't just turn off the recording. That's right. I mean, the, the open meetings law actually allows them to turn off the recorder for legal advice on specific legal questions. Um, but they kept it going. They kept their, their um, at least the audio portion of it. That's what they've released. Aaron, uh, just going to you, um, you know, you're in a, how, how big is, is Uray's population? So we, we cover the whole county and that's okay. about, um, all of Uray County is about 4,500. So we've really got a town, a city, and then unincorporated county that's included in that. So um, Uray itself is like 800 and I would say Ridgeway is about 1,000. So small communities. So you have, uh, so um, now my understanding just following your Twitter feed is that you have attended as a reporter uh, a handful of these meetings What's been your experience covering them um, in maybe a smaller part of the, the state, a smaller, smaller towns? So you mean pre-COVID or are you talking after COVID? Yeah, di no, during COVID, like what's it been oh, like covering COVID. these meetings? Like, it's more than yeah. a handful. Um, we actually, um, that's one of my main concerns actually about this covering public meetings during COVID is um, we kept track and we covered more than 18 hours of meetings in one week. Um, and for a small newsroom with two full-time people, that is a huge burden just to try to keep an eye on them. Uh, so we really, in a, in a small county, we have two school districts, a town, a city, a county commission board. Um, we've got a sheriff's department, a marshal's office, and a police department. So um, it's a lot to cover in a small area. There's a lot of decisions that could be made. And especially now that they've all enacted these emergency resolutions like um, Jeff was talking about, which allow them to have these special meetings to make decisions without maybe noticing it um, to the public. I mean, they still have to let us know their meeting and what they're meeting about, but maybe they wouldn't have as much notice as they would normally about, say, like a, a planning and zoning decision or um, decisions like that, like a budget or, or something like that. Um, but these these meetings, they, they happen whenever, and it's um, a huge burden and it's exhausting and just keeping track of who is there in these meetings is also difficult because as we all know, um, if you have a quorum of officials, uh, it should be a properly noticed meeting. And sometimes when you're looking at these Zoom meetings, you can't really tell who's in there because sometimes it'll just be like a black screen that says iPhone or Galaxy 6. And it's like, wait, who is that? Um, and, and we actually have had incidents where um, we've had a quorum of uh, commissioners in a meeting about something that they were making a decision about the following week 
um, we thought that one of them saw the other one and left the meeting, but then he came back in. They both talked about something that was public business and we called them on it. We wrote a column saying that they had violated the open meetings laws. How, um, I think one of the things that's probably lost by not being there is that you just can't talk to commissioners or board members, whoever it is. Um, you're just sort of stuck um, calling them afterwards. Um, is that, I, I mean, how much more difficult would you describe the reporting process um, and, and getting follow up in particular under an environment like this? I think um, with the public officials, it's not not as hard as you might think just because we're in a small community and we, I mean, they know we're here and, and they're here and we all know where everyone lives. So, I mean, I, I'm sure we could find people if we needed to. Um, but it's, I think it's harder to gauge uh, public comment because that has been, um, you know, so controlled in this Zoom environment. We have a situation where we can have far more participation than we've had in the past. I mean, it's far more convenient for someone to call in and, you know, they might be listening while they do their laundry or whatever, or in the middle of the day at work with headphones on or things like that. But it's not the same type of participation, if that makes sense. There's no opportunity for someone to just unmute themselves and stand up and say, you know, this isn't okay. Or, you know, in a public meeting where you have in-person uh, participation, you get a sense of a, um, a feeling from the room. And in Zoom, it's not, it's not the same. It really isn't the same where someone has to like raise their hand and be unmuted. And that, that mute button is, is really powerful. Uh, because, you know, that's where all the power is, right? Makes sense. Um, okay, uh, well, we're, we're happy to um, welcome Doug Bell in now that we've, uh, we've gotten Zoom successfully updated. Um, I will ask my last uh, question of Steve Zansberg, and then I will turn the panel over to Doug, since uh, Doug uh, knows, knows this subject a lot better than I do. But Steve, uh, you know, just given everything that we've talked about so far, are we in danger of this potentially becoming a permanent fixture even when things are safe again that, you know, boards may just continue or, or, or governments may just continue to do stuff like this because, you know, as Aaron sort of talked about, they have a lot more control. And you know what? Um, we just like this. It's more convenient for people. It actually increases access because people don't have to be there in person. Are we in danger of anything like that? Uh, well, you're asking me to predict the future. And uh, that, that's... Uh... Not an easy thing to do, but my, my gut tells me that uh, no, uh, government agencies are, uh, unlike private business, I think more and more uh, private businesses uh, are going to be resorting to video conferencing to a far greater extent, uh, not to the exclusion of in-person meetings, but I think there's going to be much less air travel uh, when we emerge from coronavirus uh, lockdown. Um, because of cost savings and, uh, you know, I think there's going to be less commercial uh, real estate being used as well. There's going to be far more telecommuting. So I think this episode, however long it lasts, is going to have some dramatic longer term effects, as you suggest. But I think government bodies, other than perhaps the United States Congress and folks who have to come from, you know, maybe the General Assembly, where we now have a number of members not wanting to come because of uh, their health concerns, their, like myself, ad, of advanced years uh, and don't want to subject themselves or family members to contagion. But by and large, you know, school boards and uh, city councils and things of that are not uh, terribly long halls for people to attend. And I think, um, as Erin was saying, we, we all are right now experiencing the limits of uh, Zoom and WebEx and all the other video platforms. And you know, they suffice, but uh, there's just so much give and take that is lost. Um, and there are a whole number of government institutions. I should mention I'm on a national committee that's looking at online dispute resolution, including courts' use of uh, online um, teleconferencing in lieu of live appearances. And um, I mean, I think there'll be more of it in different walks of life, including uh, in uh, dispute resolution, and particularly arbitration and mediation, less so than court where you need a jury to be there in, in person and uh, assess the credibility of witnesses. But um, 
I, I don't see it, uh, WebEx and, and uh, Zoom supplanting actual in-person meetings when we emerge from this episode. So one, one follow-up is, is it even legal for them? I mean, what, can you just walk us through the legality of, you know, the fact that they're even hosting these things remotely now? Um, did law have to be changed or was it like, what was the legal, I guess, justification or ability for them to even do this in the first place? Well, uh, as Jeff said, you know, the, the open meetings law uh, merely declares that certain meetings of uh, two or more members of a state public body, three or more members of a local, not state public body, basically, um, is uh, at which any public business is discussed or is to be the substantial portion of the discussion is open to the public and must be noticed, et cetera. But the open meetings law doesn't say anything about whether the meetings must be conducted in person or through any other means. All it says is if it is conducted by any means, including through electronic communications or other, any other means of communications, it is a meeting subject to this law. Uh, various uh, boards and counties and school boards and um, you know, municipal law dictate, have spe specifics about when and where meetings must occur. Those have to be amended and have been amended in certain circumstances to allow for uh, not in-person meetings when they previously did require that. And that's what you know, Congress of the United States and the General Assembly has been wrestling with. But the open meetings law itself doesn't dictate uh, any means by which such meetings must occur. It only dictates that they are open to the public if based upon the quorum and public discussion uh, requirements. You know, it, 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 no, it, just ahead, so, it just so happened that right before the legislature um, recessed uh, back in March, that they passed a bill and got it quickly signed by the governor about school boards. So school boards, school boards have had uh, the ability to have electronic uh, meetings and bring somebody in remotely, but they weren't able to count them in the quorum. So they could only do it for maybe one, one member, you know, who wasn't able to, to make it or something like that. Um, and this bill, which, which really had, you know, was pre-COVID, it, it, was, it was really introduced because of, you know, school board members in rural areas who have to travel over a pass or something to get to the meeting uh, in bad weather or whatever. Um, they they introduced and passed this bill that allowed uh, uh, electronic participants to be included in the quorum, and and uh, and then when COVID happened, uh, Polis just signed it really quickly because because it suddenly you know became really relevant to school boards. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had a they wouldn't have been able to 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 do that. I don't think. Um, you know, I was thinking about other things that I've been hearing about. Um, the Colorado Politics did a story last week where they quoted me in it. Marianne Goodland did a, did a story about the legislature and um, in the in-between time after they recessed and then recently came back, there was a bunch of stuff that got decided um, about how they were going to handle coming back that was done on a really ad hoc basis. And there's no record of that. There's a bunch of meetings that undoubtedly happened that were technically open meetings that journalists never knew anything about. They were never noticed. They were never invited into the meeting. They just happened. You, you, um, you know, if there was a, uh, the, the, the meetings of the Legislative Council's Executive Committee, uh, which is a standing committee, were noticed, but then these ad hoc meetings that they just created, uh, they, I guess, looked at it and said, "Well, it's not a real committee. We don't have to notice them because we don't have, we don't have a quorum or a majority coming of any real committee. So nothing was ever noticed, and a lot of these decisions were made about how they were going to, um, you know, have." Uh, protect people at the Capitol, how they were going to have social distancing, all the policies that they put in place. A lot of these things just happened. And uh, Marianne was smart enough to start asking questions about it. There's really no great answer. They just did it. Um, so 
I am going to take this time to just say to the attendees, if you have questions, um, feel free to drop that into the chat um, and we will take a look at that. Um, and uh, at this stage, uh, Doug Bell, uh, do you want to go ahead and ask a few questions if you have any? You are on mute at the moment. Uh, let me see if I can unmute you. Okay, how's that? There we go. All Hi, right. everybody. I feel like I'm walking in the middle of a movie here, but um, <laughs> I have a question for Jeff. Jeff, uh, how has all this new normal weirdness um, affected open records requests? Yeah, um, and Steve will have a lot to say about that too, but it, it is um, uh, affected it quite a bit in some places. Right before this meeting, uh, like 10 minutes before this meeting started, I got an email from a guy who lives in Durango, made a records request and got a response from the deputy city clerk saying, sorry, we just can't get to that right now because of COVID. You know, no, and, and, and she does cite, you know, she cites the statute, the statutory provision on extenuating circumstances. So the way the response time in, in Cora is, um, uh, a reasonable time presumed to be three working days. I'm not quite sure why it's worded like that. But then um, governments can ask for another seven working days if extenuating circumstances apply and they have to submit that to you in writing within the three initial three days. And, and you know, you can easily argue that COVID is an extenuating circumstance. Uh, I, we all get that. Um, but to Jen just say, you know, not even say we, we're, we're going to get, say, set an additional seven working days. It's just totally open-ended. That's another thing. Um, Tri-County Health Department has been doing that. Uh, reporters have been getting um, answers to their CORA requests saying, we may not be able to get to this for at least 30 days. Um, Steve, Steve's had to write letters about that. Um, there's a lawsuit that uh, Dan Kaplis, the the radio talk show host and lawyer has filed against the health department, uh, the state health department on the same type of thing. His core request, which he paid a bunch of money for the records, they, uh, as far as I know, still haven't gotten him the records and he sued and I'm not sure where that is, but that's happened. Um, so there's, there's the delays. And then um, the other issue is the cost which is an ongoing issue with Cora. Um, we have a University of Denver law student who's writing a report for us uh, about the cost of Cora. We'll be coming out with that probably later in the summer. Um, and in particular, you know, emails. It's always been an issue, has been an issue for a while. When you request emails, um, the, the, the hourly rate to retrieve them and then to also uh, review them for, you know, some exemption that might apply um, can really run up the cost into hundreds and thousands of dollars. Well, with COVID, um, it's a very important story to find out through emails or text messages how government is responding to this crisis. You guys probably all saw the Colorado Public Radio story Ben Marcus did about came out about two weeks or three weeks ago now uh, on the early response. Uh, they started making requests at the end of February um, and two things happened, the same two things I've been talking about. Number one, uh, and, and Steve had to write a letter about this one. Uh, they made the request for the records. They ended up paying for the records and it was what, 50 days? Uh, and they still hadn't gotten the records. And the only reason they released the records is because Steve wrote a letter. Uh, then um, if you look at the bottom of the story that they posted, um, they paid $2,000 or more for those records. So how many news organizations in Colorado other than Colorado Public Radio are in a position to pay two grand for records for one story? Um, it, there's not many. So it was a really good story, a really important story, but there's many more important stories to do. And um, that's an issue. The, the, um, <clears throat> there are other reporters uh, also trying to get emails and other records about 
what's happening related to COVID. And I've talked to reporters uh, who have gotten estimates of four or $5,000 for records. Um, and so that's an issue, it's a huge issue. Doug, you're muted. I was trying to drown out my dog. Um, Steve, what's the best move if reporters and editors are getting delays for open records requests at this point? Uh, well, it's uh, the same as before COVID. I mean, it's to, to, to push back as forcefully as you can and to try to negotiate in a friendly, uh, a collaborative way about maybe limiting the scope of your request if that's doable. Um, the, the two letters that um, Jeff mentioned that I wrote uh, on behalf of Colorado Public Radio and, and one uh, more recently <coughs> for Nine News uh, were, were described by a, a, a long-term client as the nastiest letters he's seen uh, uh, under my signature. Um, and, and partly it's an outgrowth of um, our meetings at the uh, Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition. And many of you know Nicole Vapp, uh, who's our uh, vice president and uh, is the head of the investigative unit at Nine News. And early on, we had an in-face, uh, in-person meeting before the lockdown um, where she said that in, in the early, in the run-up before uh, the stay-at-home orders, you would think that all of these government officials were in the emergency rooms intubating patients and performing life-saving uh, medical aid because uh, they're, they're all saying that they're, you know, they're beset with a public health crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen in a century, which is true. Um, but does that really excuse their complying with their duties under the law to uh, provide records to the public? particularly when members of the press, although, you know, the law doesn't, it's not limited to members of the press, but many of the, the calls I and, and uh, Jeff get are from uh, the Aaron McIntyres of the world and, and other members of the press who are trying to hold their government uh, accountable and explain how the government is responding to this um, massive uh, public health crisis. And so, um, you know, I think, it, it goes a long way to be uh, more, particularly, you know, since COVID-19, it's hard to keep up with uh, all of the crazy stuff that's going on in the world. But, you know, the, the protests in the wake of the murder in, in Minneapolis have now overtaken the news cycle and the president calling out the military to take to the American streets and, and attack the protesters. Um, you know, it's, it, there's so much going on, um, and I think it, it's helpful when you are talking to government officials, bureaucrats, folks in your local government offices, to be understanding and to be human and, and to, um, you know, basically share stories and, and uh, what it's like to be living from your home with your kids and your dogs and working from there and we're, you know, we're all in this together. I don't mean that like as a political message, but we're all going through uh, some pretty serious stuff. And um, I think being understanding and saying, look, I know you can't get it to me. You might not even have access to some of those files, but, you know, what can you get me and how, when can I get it? You know, we took great offense at the Tri-County Health Department, who's uh, ex um, vice, uh, the, the second in command there, sent out these emails, just pattern stock email uh, letter responses to all CORA requests that given the health crisis, we, we won't even be responding to your request for at least 30 days. Um, at least 30 days means that that includes never, right? I mean, there's no end in sight. And, you know, it's not even um, authorized by the Colorado Open Records Act, which provides for extenuating circumstances of uh, seven additional working days beyond the three-day presumptive time frame. So where they, they get off just saying, well, you know, we've got the worst public health crisis and uh, we'll get back to you uh, sometime after 30 days, that sort of drew my ire and that of uh, the client to say, well, I'm sorry, but we're ready to take you to court over this 
because there's no such provision in the law that allows you to just say, we'll get back to you, maybe never. Um, but so that was a bit, you know, feisty and, and, and aggressive, perhaps it did get results. But th that, you know, when the lawyers get involved, that's pretty late in the game. I still think your journalists, all the journalists uh, paying attention to the uh, who are viewing or listening to this, um, ought to try to you know, narrow the request if possible and work with the person on the other end of the phone or the email chain about um, some compromise position, understanding how difficult these times are, what can we do to, to make this work. Um, and you sort of have to put a little bit on the back burner the notion that I want it yesterday. I asked for it five days ago. I deserve it three days. And, you know, get it. I, I think you get much more done by being uh, collaborative and uh, trying to work towards solutions than being aggressive. Uh, let, let the attorneys be aggressive. You guys uh, try, try to work it out uh, in a more friendly way. So I, I have a question for Steve. Um, <clears throat> a response I've gotten or that some reporters have gotten that I've heard about that I haven't had a chance to run by you, Steve. Um, some reporters are trying to get emails um, related to, say, the JBS plant in, in Greeley. Um, a reporter from California uh, called me about this. I know the Greeley Tribunes had the same issue. And they are getting denied uh, saying it's an ongoing administrative investigation, that, that it's just, you know, it's, it's not there. We, we all know what's going on with the JBS, JBS plant in Greeley, but how long can they, can they cite that? Because it seems like it's going to be an issue that we live with for a while. Yeah, I mean, this is a very particular question. I'm, I'm not um, sure of uh, who's doing the investigation and what records are being requested. Um, it, you know, not everything that is involved in an uh, administrative investigation before it's completed is part of the investigation file. Even that provision that got uh, amended a few years back makes clear that things that were a matter of public record before the investigation that really weren't created for as part of the investigation don't get swept up in that exception. Uh, so if they, for some reason they, um, you know, took the Greeley phone book to um, find out which, uh, mem which employees live within city limits or what, whatever they were doing with what was previously a, you know, a, a widely shared public record or the Greeley Tribune, a copy of a Greeley Tribune story doesn't become subject to non-disclosure because they're using it as part of that investigation. But again, I don't think that's so much COVID related as just your ordinary uh, government offices saying uh, we're going to not cooperate and uh, if you don't like it, take us to court. Yeah, these were state health department emails that uh, at least a, I remember a Dow Jones reporter asked for. And what they did is they pointed him to the state's website where all the, all the uh, facilities with COVID outbreaks are listed. And you can see where it says active or closed. Um, and uh, their response was, you can't get, we're not gonna give you any records, any emails um, related to the ones that say active. Yeah, I suspect that's an over, uh, again, a, a, an extent, over uh, broad um, application of that provision. Um, you know, I, I, I we'll let get Doug uh, ask some more questions, but w one thing that occurred to me um, when you were talking about a number of government officials in Colorado taking leeway with uh, the time frame and the, the cost, both of which you mentioned, Jeff, um, in light of the COVID crisis, um, we should note that a number of other states, and there's a good collection of them on the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press website that is keeping track of uh, COVID uh, effect on both uh, open meetings and open records laws. A number of governors and mayors uh, in, in states outside of Colorado have granted blanket exemptions uh, from time requirements for responding to open records and have also granted additional exemptions from their open meetings laws. So thankfully we haven't done that. 
Um, and uh, but it is interesting that a number of other um, states and, and localities outside of Colorado have uh, basically said we get a timeout automatically because of COVID. Aaron, you're on the front lines. Uh, I know you've had some open meetings issues with your school districts out there. Do you think it's more a case typically of the officials not understanding the law or trying to circumvent the law? Um, I actually think uh, both. I think we've had two recent incidents with um, both school districts. So um, the first incident that we had um, happened back in, Oh gosh, it was April um, and it involved the Ridgeway School District and they were using special meetings that um, were initially COVID related, like response to COVID, our kids coming to school, what are we doing about online learning, that kind of stuff. Uh, they used those meetings to um, do regular business and in those meetings with regular business, they severely limited public comment. And, you know, like Jeff said before, um, there's no provision requiring them to allow public comment, but they did this thing where they said that their new policy was that all of their public comment needed to be submitted in writing more than 24 hours before the meeting even happened, specifically in a Word document. And then it would be read into the record. And so um, we were very concerned about that. Um, and we wrote a letter about our concerns to be entered into the record in a Word document. And it was read into the record. And then they went ahead and did what they said they were gonna do anyway and not allow people to speak. I mean, there were people raising their hands in the meeting and they, they would not unmute them. And in that meeting, they ended up approving a contract for a new administrator that was a little bit controversial. So it was very clear to us that they just wanted to avoid that public comment that was maybe not so savory to them. So that was the first one. Um, and then the second incident, I think this is really a, a lack of understanding perhaps although I, I sort of wonder, uh, we're still sort of in the midst of it. Um, it involved the URA school board. They fired their last superintendent mid-year um, and they decided to hire a new superintendent. There were three finalists and then they spent more than 10 hours in executive session discussing who they wanted to hire. Um, it became pretty clear to me after like hour six of executive session that maybe they weren't using executive session for what they're supposed to be using it for. Um, I mean, when it goes on that long, I, you kind of wonder if like one of their board members is just being beaten into submission to have a unanimous decision or uh, if they're talking about somebody's sick cat. I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about in there. Um, but I expressed concerns about it and um, I said, you know, you guys really need to make a decision in public. Um, your decision about who to hire to be your next superintendent needs to be one made in public. And then they ignored me and announced they had made a decision. So um, in that case, they did actually seek uh, legal advice from their attorney. Um, and uh, we've also sought some advice from an attorney. So we'll see what happens there. Um, so I, I think in that case, it's a fairly new board. Maybe they don't have an understanding of the law. We expressed concerns, but they went ahead and did it anyway. So that's kind of where we're at. So they made a decision in the exec session and then came out and rubber stamped it with a vote. They didn't even vote when they came out. They approved a contract. They, their, they said that their attorney's advice was that they could go ahead and make the decision in executive session. And in fact, the, the attorney's advice basically said that um, the public didn't need to see that messy business and that they would be none the wiser that was in an email. It would be, they would be none the wiser. I'm looking at Steve's face. It's hilarious. <laughs> I know my head almost exploded. Um, yeah, the public will be none the wiser. And then he advised them that they only needed to vote on um, after the person they had hired already signed the contract and it was a done deal, then they would vote 
to sign the contract also. Nothing rubber stamp about that. Yeah. Right. Steve's, so, Steve's written yeah. letters on this topic too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, how you, yeah. I've ever heard anyone make that ridiculous argument. <laughs> so there's one tiny little provision in the school board meetings law that just you should be aware of. I don't know how helpful it is, but um, school boards are, when they go into executive session, they're actually required to keep track of how many minutes they discuss particular issues. Oh. in executive session and then include that in minutes that are posted on their websites. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. It's, so we'll get to find out every minute of that 10 well, hours. That's go, you know, I'll send you that part of 2232108. I don't okay. know how helpful it is, but it's in there. Well, it, it might be helpful. Also, we've been looking at how they, um, what part of the law they specifically cited to go into executive session. And I have some real concerns about that. They have a habit of just using the blanket of the law and not really being very specific. And right. so I think that's also a major concern that we have. And I, you know, at this point, I actually told them all these concerns. I spelled it all out. I've asked them for the tapes and um, they wrote me an email and said, no, if we gave you the tapes, then there would be no point of executive session. And they invited me to get on the agenda at their next meeting to try to convince them. And I just, I don't really see a point to that at this point. Yeah, that topic specificity is actually the subject of a court of appeals case now that Steve and some other uh, attorneys are arguing um, because uh, basalt uh, well, a judge ruled, a district court judge ruled that that, uh, that that topic specificity part of the open meetings law was just a, what did he call it, Steve, a technicality or something? Technicality, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that, I listened to the Court of Appeals arguments on this and they didn't seem to buy that, but they haven't issued their ruling yet. Hey, all in the time we have left, um, it's been a really tough week for journalists, both in Colorado and the rest of the country covering these protests. And um, we've seen at least three journalists here in Denver, uh, Jeremy Hahola, Alex Burness, and Young Chang be targeted by police with pepper balls or what, I'm not even sure what to call things these days, because you, I guess when you say tear gas, it sets off a whole debate, but um, I'd be interested in your take, Jeff and Steve, on what's been happening and what we need to do to keep our fellow journalists safe and uh, what are our options here for getting a response from the cops and the, and the officials? Yeah, so um, Saturday night, I was looking at my Twitter feed. I already knew about Young Chang and because um, uh, they'd already done a story about that. And, um, but just kept seeing more of that kind of thing. And so Sunday morning, I decided to find all the examples I could find where journalists felt like they had been targeted. And I think I put together seven uh, examples. Um, not everybody was hit, but some, some felt like they, you know, it was, it was right at them, uh, that it was deliberate. Um, and, and, you know, if that's the case, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's inexcusable on a lot of levels, but in particular, it's a violation of First Amendment and state constitutional free press rights uh, to, to report on an event in a public space. Um, it's been, seems like it's been better the last two, three days uh, because um, there just hasn't been as much um, police presence, I think, and hasn't been as much uh, activity downtown that has led to uh, turmoil, um, but but it still uh, happened, and 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 I think we had to call it out, and so and so um, uh, we wrote a letter on Monday, um, sent it to um, the governor, the mayor, the police chief, the head of the Department of Public Safety, the head of State Patrol, the head of the National Guard, and we've only received a response from the uh, head of the State Patrol. He, he wrote me a letter um, saying they didn't, 
They never intended to target anybody. They want to meet, see what they can do. Nobody else has responded directly to this letter, which is a little disappointing, um, because I think, you know, this has to be talked about. This has to, you know, obviously, uh, anybody who was who was targeted by police, uh, you know, if they were peaceful, that's that's not appropriate. But journalists is, are what we, in particular, are concerned about, and they ought they need to be able to do their jobs, to to record. Uh, in a, an event like that. Um, and so um, we need to have more discussions about how we, you know, if this happens again, um, what do we need to do uh, to make sure that they can do their jobs? Steve, are there any legal remedies? Uh, well, there, there can be. There's a suit that's currently pending in uh, U.S. District Court in Minnesota um, that the ACLU uh, and several other organizations have brought a class action on behalf of journalists who were uh, victimized there. It, it's really uh, horrific, um, far far worse, uh, bad for them, good for us. I, I guess that no one here has suffered uh, to the extent of uh, the injuries that are uh, set forth in that document. There, there's a freelance journalist by the name of Linda Torado who was uh, hit in her left eye yeah. um, and with a less lethal projectile, as they're called. And she's now permanently blinded in her left eye uh, from covering the uh, protests in Minneapolis. And they have a photo of her in their complaint. It's, it's really quite horrific. Um, so yeah, they've, they've filed a suit that seeks uh, both uh, monetary damages for the constitutional violations, as well as injunctive relief prohibiting any uh, further uh, violations of constitutional rights. Those are uh, the legal remedies that are available, but you know, I do want to echo what um, Jeff just said, that um, it's always better, as I've said in the uh, same realm as, of uh, open records, open meetings, it's better not to go to court, better not to sue people, much better to, uh, to work collaboratively and to try to come up with uh, solutions. Um, and, you know, one of the uh, law enforcement agencies involved in the Denver um, uh, response, uh, had, as Susie Green has written on, on her own uh, Colorado Independent blog, agreed to conduct training of its officers to settle, and, and Jeff mentioned this in the letter that he sent as well, um, you know, last September, uh, Denver police settled a, a threatened civil lawsuit uh, with Susie Green after they arrested her and manhandled her and uh, told her to act like a lady. Um, and they, uh, you know, not only paid out $50,000 uh, to settle that claim, but they committed to, con to engage um, a, a colleague of mine from uh, back east, Mickey Osterreicher, the general counsel for the National Press Photographers Association, to come out here and do officer training, and that's yet to occur. Now, the COVID uh, lockdown has uh, come about in the interim, but still um, it is of concern that there are officers um, uh, who, who clearly don't understand that um, the members of the press are expressly carved out of the state, the, the curfew orders that Mayor Hancock entered, um, and they're to be accommodated and not attacked uh, for doing their jobs. Uh, they, I agree with Jeff and what many others have said, that all the protesters have a right to peaceably assemble, um, and they have a right to be given notice that they need to clear the streets prior to any type of uh, crowd control or riot control uh, methods are deployed. Um, but the press has a, an additional constitutional right to be there documenting what the police and, and law enforcement agencies are doing. And uh, you would hope, I, I would have hoped that uh, Jeff's letter uh, would have drawn uh, more responses than from just the head of the CSP. Steve, I have one sort of follow-up question to that, and, and I've been wondering about this, but you know, in an era when there's, you know, everybody has a phone and they're, they can record anything, um, how, how does the law, how does the government see what a reporter or a journalist is? Because 
you've got all these people who could technically be in some small way like performing an act of journalism or doing something by recording um, you know the way police are handling these situations whatever it might be what is the distinguishment is it that I've got a press pa pass around my neck from the um, you know Colorado Press Association or, or somewhere else how is that defined on, for the purposes of this discussion well, yeah, I mean, there there is this recurring uh, problem of um, deciding who is and who is not the press in this modern era where everyone has on their phone the means to disseminate video and audio worldwide. Um, and, you know, Colorado, so I, I always think of this because this isn't limited to covering protests. It's true in the city and county buildings and and the courts, in, particularly in Denver, that are treating members of the working press no differently than everyone else, even though their own policies recognize that the working press, the institutional press, the credentialed press, it depends how you want to identify them, are different. And they're courted uh, special rights in certain circumstances. Uh, seats are set aside in uh, high profile court cases for members of the press. Uh, you know, we let the Associated Press and, and other press organizations decide who um, occupies those seats. But we also have, you know, in place a, a Colorado Press Association uh, that provides credentialing, a Colorado Broadcasters Association that is limited to FCC licensees and their employees. And so rather than, you know, saying, oh, we can't distinguish between the professional media and ordinary citizen journalists, as, as they used to be called, we can't do anything. Um, that that's just that doesn't fly. I mean, a lot of first of all, many of the the press that were attacked and and are listed in uh, the letter that Jeff sent were wearing a neon reflective vest that say in all caps, four inch high letters, press. Some of them were attacked after they yelled out, press, press. Um, and and some a reporter for uh, a reporter and a cameraman I think for KMGH Channel Seven got hit with four paintballs uh, that if you've ever been hit with these things they can do damage they you know they're non lethal but they are painful they cause welts and they um, and they want, and, and and his camera lens was hit too um, and you know these aren't like small little cell phones these are professional grade large over on your shoulder cameras and they're clearly marked press um, which gives rise to a, a firm belief as jeff put in his letter that they're being targeted because they're the press um, that it's very different um, than just randomly uh, uh, attacking uh, folks who are holding up their cell phone and documenting police conduct, which is also a violation. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, that is also a constitutional violation. But um, the, the letter that we, uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Coalition sent out on behalf of the Press Association of Broadcasters and Society of Professional Journalists very much was saying that, um, that we have reason to believe that these acts are being taken against the institutionalized credentialed press um, and by the way, the, um, the, the mayor's um, curfew order exempts the credentialed press. It doesn't exempt anyone with a cell phone. So uh, already the government recognizes that there is a way to distinguish those who are subject to the protection and those who are not. Thanks. I'm Did wondering... that answer the question? Oh, go ahead. No, no, I just want to make, I, I hope I oh. fully answered when yeah, well, that, that answers my down. question. And uh, no, uh, and what I will do is actually, uh, Jeff, I think this is posted on the website. I will just drop the letter into the uh, chat so that everybody can, uh, panelists and attendees can read it if they haven't had a chance to, to read and it. And it's, it's on our website too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I don't think we have any uh, um, further questions, but if folks in the audience do certainly again just drop it in the chat and we can go uh, Doug uh, I'll uh, any final questions from the moderator I'd like to let each of the panelists sort of sum up or, or make any comments they would like Aaron let's start with you oh wow okay um, 
just in general about uh, covering meetings during COVID in general. Um, yeah. You know, I, I actually have a prediction. I think that we're going to see a transition to kind of a hybrid model soon. Um, we, we've talked with some of the um, uh, town councils and, and boards about this. Some of them are eager to get back to meeting in person. But of course, as long as we have that 10 person mass gathering limit in place from the state, which to be honest, doesn't seem to be being enforced here in Uray County. I mean, I, I just came from a protest with 60 people. It's, it's not being enforced. Um, you know, there's people gathering in parks, things like that. But for some reason, they're stuck on the 10 person uh, limit for official government meetings. Um, so as long as that's in place, we're going to have to see some sort of hybrid um, model because the reality is between the official elected officials and their staff or administration that needs to be in the room, we've probably already met the maximum for that in, in many cases here. And um, the other reality is we have some older folks who just don't feel comfortable meeting um, together, even with masks, even six feet apart in a room with the windows open or, you know, what have you. So I do think we're going to see a, a hybrid model coming out of this for a while. And I also think that the public has really valued the ability to access um, video recordings of meetings afterwards. Um, here in Uray County, we don't have a TV station. We don't have a public access cable channel. Um, that maybe there's one good thing that's come out of this and that's that our town, uh, Ridgeway, the, the town of Ridgeway actually started its own YouTube channel. And so they're um, archiving all of their meetings that have been recorded on there. So people who do miss out on the meeting can go watch something for themselves. And I think that's something that a lot of constituents value now. Um, although I do think a lot of them would like to get back to the in-person meetings as well. So. Um, I would say by midsummer we're going to start to see those hybrid meetings happening and it'll be interesting to see um, kind of what comes out of that and and of course we're going to be there in person because you know it's it's a more authentic experience uh, covering meetings in person and and getting a sense of the people in the room and that sort of thing so we'll we'll be there Jeff any final thoughts you know I I've I've thought many times like technology has made this all this possible now. What if this pandemic, you know, what if it was the 70s or the 80s? Um, you know, it, it, all, it, all sorts of things would have been affected, but the fact that we have this technology, um, you know, allows for public meetings to still go on and allows for people to conduct business and allows for us to have a, a panel like this and I, you know, I just can't, uh, you know, things, things would have been so different. Um, I, I agree with, with Aaron that, that, um, you know, if there's a bright side, maybe it is uh, getting more public entities to think about having um, you know, live streaming their meetings and archiving them. One of the stories I did for my blog uh, was about the Open Meeting, Open Media Foundation here in Denver they're the ones that provide the video for the legislature and they have a, a technology that uses um, YouTube and their own uh, proprietary software that archives the, the agendas and links it to the video. So you can go right to you know, a particular topic. And I think even uh, they have the ability to go, to go to a speaker if you want, a particular speaker. And, and they're, they, they make this software available for free to small local governments and more should take advantage of that type of thing. Um, there's really no excuse for it these days. Uh, not being able to, uh, if people, you know, even before and after COVID, if they can't get there, uh, you know, for making the, their meetings as accessible to people as possible, um, we were able to do that now. So um, they should do it. Thanks, Jeff. Steve? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to take a broader, more philosophical view. Um, by nature, I'm a, a pessimist, but I sort of will myself towards optimism. And um, I'm optimistic that 
uh, what comes out of this on, on the other side, wh whenever that may be, when we emerge from this, uh, you know, 10 person maximum and, uh, and, and all of the restrictions and I guess, you know, post vaccine or post eradication of coronavirus is that um, things will change for the better. Uh, again, I'm willing myself towards that optimism. And um, p part of that I find, uh, since we're talking at the Denver Press Club, is that I'm hoping that there's much less uh, hatred and animosity, well, generally in our society, but towards the press. Uh, I think that this is a time where we're seeing some really Herculean efforts by um, institutions that are uh, struggling to, to stay alive. We have furloughed uh, workers. We have, uh, you know, newspapers that um, were struggling before COVID-19 and now are really struggling because there's no advertising. Um, and yet there are people out there every day working really hard to uh, keep their readers and viewers and listeners informed about what's going on in the world, that they're trapped inside, not able to keep track of themselves. And I'm hoping, again, willing myself towards it, that uh, the public is going to appreciate that and, uh, and that we'll have all of this, um, you know, caustic naming and, and uh, you know, fake news and all this, pardon me, crap, Will, will be something of the distant past that we'll, we'll look back upon as a black period, a black mark in our history. So I, I'm hoping that all the great work that journalists are doing out there will be appreciated and, uh, and that uh, things will be better down the road. Thanks, Steve. I'm accustomed to you waxing philosophical, but the optimism thing, it's going to take a while to get used to that, I think. <laughs> Not it. Um, everybody, I think if you're if you're tuned into the chat on the side there, uh, Dan has um, promoted the next event on June 10th. Dan, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Doug. So um, we're going to be doing a 90-minute session on um, map making using Google Maps and Google Earth flyovers um, on Zoom because um, we still have that uh, that limit. So um, anybody's free to join. Uh, just have to register, and I drop the link in there. Um, it's not on our website yet at denverpressclub.org, but uh, it will be soon. Um, and I'll just, you know, um, also note that, you know, we, in, in the wake of the protests and the death of George Floyd, we are working on putting together some programming um, about that as it relates to news media. So um, be on the lookout for more of that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to discuss a little bit about that at the end of the program tonight, but, you know, um, not enough time to go into all the different angles that we could. So um, again, be on the lookout for that. Um, you can um, just go to our website at denverpresscode.org and um, sign up for our newsletter uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, if you want to get uh, event updates, um, you can like us on Facebook as well. Um, and, you know, we appreciate everybody being here. So thanks for moderating, Doug. Dan, uh, quick question. Um, do we have any idea when we might see the press club actually open for small groups? Uh, great question. Um, I, I think I have a potential lead inside the city, um, you know, that we're, we're, we're kind of in this unique position and that, you know, we're not a restaurant, of course, or at least not a full service one where uh, they technically look at us at a bar, even though I wouldn't call us a, a bar in the strictest sense. Uh, you know, we do partake in such activities, but, um, you know, generally speaking, we are a place that's open to just members and their guests. So it's very different from, say, going to lower downtown and just, you know, walking into a random bar. So we're trying to push that um, to see whether we might be able to get an exemption for small groups. And so, um, you know, we're hopeful to have an answer on that soon. And once we know something, we will share it with everybody else. But, you know, we're eager to open back up uh, again and, um, you know, we'll do it um, when we have the okay to do so. I want to thank all the panelists who were so quick to agree to join us and give their time tonight. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Um, and I think we're about ready to wrap up. Great. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe and healthy everyone. You too.